Hosting our discussion this morning is Walter Lohman. Walter is director of our Asian Studies Center. Prior to joining Heritage, he served as senior vice president and executive director of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council for a period of four years. He had previously served as the council's senior country director, representing American interests in Indonesia and Singapore. He has also held positions on as a Senate staff member, serving as senior professional Republican staff for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as well as serving as a policy aide to Senator John McCain. Currently, Mr. Lohman also serves as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, where he leads a graduate seminar on American foreign policy interests in Southeast Asia. Please join me in welcoming Walter Lohman. Walter. Thank you, John. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming out. It's good to see such a such an interest in uh, in this topic, and that we are we are also live on the internet, and we'll have this archived and ship it out as far and wide as we possibly can afterwards. Um, it's a really important issue: uh, the future of mill-to-mill -mill relations uh, with Burma, and uh, it's not quite clear exactly what's going on. Uh, thus, the need for today's program. Um, Congress has taken the lead on this issue really for 20 years. It's it's not always clear for headline to headline nowadays, but that, that is indeed the case. Uh, I think some of the names we maybe most associate with the issue uh, on the Hill have been taking their lead from the administration for the last couple of years. And um, it's really good to know that, uh, that there are still some voices on the Hill that are, that are forging an independent course um, on U.S.-Burma relations and sort of uh, keeping the feet to the fire of uh, interested parties, particularly the U.S. government. So on that note, I want, I want to introduce our, our, um, our chief speaker here, our, our keynote speaker. I'm very pleased to have uh, Steve Shabbat, congressman from Ohio here. He's spent a long, term on Capitol, uh, long time on Capitol Hill, 17 years. He's on the Judici Judiciary Committee and Small Business Committee, and he's on the HVAC, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and most um, relevant to what we're talking about here today, he's chairman of the Asia-Pacific Subcommittee and has expressed some interest specifically in this issue and, and taken a leadership role. So I'm glad to uh, introduce Congressman Steve Shabbat. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Thank you very much, Walter, and uh, good morning. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here uh, at the Heritage Foundation this morning with so many friends and uh, leading uh, experts uh, to speak with you about an issue that's extremely important to broader U.S. Uh, objectives in the Asia-Pacific region, and that is, of course, uh, Burma. But before I get into my remarks, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Walter Lohman, uh, our host and our moderator uh, this morning, and our distinguished uh, panel here today for their leadership role in the Asia-Pacific region, particularly in regards to Burma. Uh, we greatly appreciate the hard work and dedication uh, of scholars and activists like Walter and uh, like Jan Quigley and John Sifton and uh, Keith Luce. Uh, Jan and John uh, both gave excellent testimony uh, on the situation in Burma before our subcommittee last month, and I want to thank them both again for their uh, considerable contribution. I also commend Heritage for its willingness to take the path, uh, shall we say, sometimes less traveled. Uh, on many issues, uh, including uh, Burma, uh, helping to shape the United States foreign policy objectives in the Asia-Pacific region is one of my top legislative priorities as chairman of the uh, Asian Pacific Subcommittee. Our committee and our jurisdiction uh, expanded uh, this year and now stretches as far north as Mongolia and south to New Zealand, uh, from Pakistan in the west to the Pacific Island nations uh, in the east. The addition of South Asia, including uh, India and Pakistan in particular, uh, has expanded many of the challenges that uh, our nation faces, our committee uh, face, and that we all face. The Asia-Pacific region is home to more than 50% of the world's population and accounts for more than half of world trade. This region is the scene of some of the United States' most important economic, commercial, geopolitical, and security interests. Now more than ever, America's future uh, is inextricably linked to Asia's future, and it is our responsibility as policymakers and as academics and as elected officials uh, to closely monitor how events occurring in this remote part of the globe are impacting vital U.S. interests. Burma 
is a part of this important region and has received a significant amount of attention of late, particularly given President Obama's policy goal of rebalancing United States uh, foreign policy toward Asia. Uh, as chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific, I agree that indeed a lot has changed in Burma over the last three years. In fact, I traveled to Burma in August of last year and I saw with my own eyes uh, some of these, uh, these changes that we've uh, heard reported about. But as we will discuss this morning, the question uh, on, that we face is, is whether enough change has occurred to warrant the administration's latest policy push uh, in that country. To be sure, we are all thrilled that Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi is now free and an elected member of parliament. The same must be said for the regime's release of political prisoners and the steps that they have taken to open up to the international community. But the fundamental question that lies before us is, has the regime made enough reforms to justify the Obama administration's unilateral decision to begin high-level military-to-military engagement? I believe that the answer to this question is no. Let me explain why. If Burma succeeds in transforming itself from a harsh military dictatorship to a flourishing democracy, then it is obviously the people of Burma who stand to benefit the most. Without a doubt, on the surface, Burma appears much different than it did only a few years ago. Businesses from around the globe are rushing in uh, to seek a stake in Burma's economy and their abundant uh, natural resources. Sanctions have been lifted, uh, investors uh, and tourists are moving back in. But below the surface, the picture uh, is oftentimes much different. We are seeing historically rooted nationalistic attitudes taking shape as hate speech and bigotry against ethnic and religious minorities. Some predict that the level of violence we have seen to date is only the beginning and experts worry extremist groups in the region may try to take advantage of these volatile conditions. The spread of anti-Muslim propaganda, for example, is on the upswing. The UN Special Rapporteur of, on Human Rights has noted that the Burmese government needs to do much more to stymie the spread of militant discriminatory views and to protect vulnerable minority communities. Former Congressman Tom Andrews, who also testified before our subcommittee last month, is working tirelessly to promulgate the realities of this anti-Muslim violence, the Burmese government's complicity thereto, and the significant human rights abuses being committed throughout Burma. His efforts have been extremely valuable, and he has put his own safety at risk through his work. I want to commend Tom for his courageous undertaking. And I might add that I'm a Republican and he's a Democrat, so I'm saying that uh, true bipartisanship here. There are also concerns about political prisoners and those conditionally released political prisoners who live under the threat that they could be re-imprisoned at any time. In addition, land grabbing is epidemic as entire communities are being forced off their land by government officials, oftentimes at the behest of business cronies seeking lucrative foreign investment partnerships. And most importantly for this morning's discussion, the Burmese military's leverage over the government remains intact, and its participation in human rights abuses against ethnic and religious minorities is rampant. It is my belief that, unfortunately, in transitioning from a more restrictive action-for-action action approach to a less restrictive engagement strategy, the Obama administration has essentially given Burma a blank check. No longer is engagement linked to continued reforms, as I strongly believe it should be. Instead, we are moving full steam ahead without any real assurances that the nascent reforms will become permanent, irreversible reforms. As we have seen elsewhere in the world, unconditional military uh, assistance can lead to unanticipated outcomes. Absent any fixed expectations or benchmarks to measure reforms, what leverage do we have left to pressure the Burmese military to do the right thing? As it stands today, there is very little. 
The United States has already demonstrated its sincerity to the Burmese government by letting sanctions expire, by conducting a first ever visit by President Obama and then Secretary Clinton, and by inviting President Thinsane to visit the White House. Despite these positive developments, the Burmese military has given little indication, other than high level dictum, that they are interested in the genuine changes Burmese government has promised it would make. Uh, before. Earlier this year, Burma's defense minister, uh, Hulamin, asserted that his country's military is, and I quote, 100 percent in support, unquote, of reformist President Thin Sein's agenda, but qualified his statement by saying, and I quote again, when the time is right, we will make the changes. Not particularly reassuring. In early June, then Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta stated that the U.S. was interested in improving its military ties with Burma. If that country continued implementing democratic reforms and improved its human rights record. Understanding that the prospect of successful long-term reform was largely in the hands of the nation's military, the idea in theory held merit. However, less than six months later, the administration has changed course from action for action to action for hope. This does not exactly inspire confidence. Something that many of my colleagues in Congress find particularly uninspiring is the fact that the administration has made itself unavailable to testify before Congress on what its plans are in the short term and long term regarding its engagement with Burma's military. I know this because our subcommittee has been asking them to do so for six months now without success. The Obama administration has also ignored and disregarded the concerns of Burma's ethnic minorities who continue to express their opposition to military engagement between the U.S. and Burma. Their point of view is that the U.S. must not establish full military relations with Burma unless certain preconditions are met. When we examine where Burma is today compared to where it was only a few years ago, it's important to understand the regime's underlying motivation for taking the actions that it has up to this point. Burma has long relied almost exclusively on one beneficiary, China, much to its own detriment, I would add. In turning the corner from pariah state to the what oftentimes appears to be the darling of Southeast Asia now, the leaders of Burma have made a very calculated move to diversify its relations and prevent itself from being totally dependent upon its giant neighbor to the north. And in the early days of our engagement, it was precisely the action for action strategy that the U.S. and the international community used that resulted in the reforms we see today. In short, Burma knew it had to make changes in order to see improved relations. So it acted, and the world, including the United States, responded. Restoring military ties with Burma is one of the United States' few remaining points of leverage with Burma, and Burma's leaders know this. If the situation in Burma were to deteriorate, and, for example, to send back into a military, uh, a military run dictatorship once again, reimposing uh, sanctions would be a heavy lift, especially in today's political climate. And let's face it, the Obama administration has invested a lot in Burma's success story. And getting tough with Burma, even if they wanted, doesn't seem like it would be in the cards. However, I would urge the administration to reassess its engagement strategy and clarify its proclamations of conditionality by establishing expectations with respect to Burma. Another troubling fact is that Burma has not severed its ties with North Korea, perhaps the most deplorable regime on the face of the earth. It ought to be a condition of any improved relations with the United States the ties with the greatest violator of human rights on the globe be terminated. The Obama administration's approach of granting military-to-military -military relations to Burma is unlikely to prove beneficial in any of the following important goals. Ending the Burmese military's perpetration of human rights violations, 
helping Burma achieve national reconciliation, reforming Burma's constitution, or creating an independent judiciary. In addition, the Burmese military should be required to do all of the following. Demonstrate a sincere interest in reform, make substantial progress in ending gross violations of human rights and humanitarian law, adhere to conditions laid out in ceasefire agreements, allow humanitarian access to conflict areas, and establish institutional reforms that allow perpetrators of human rights violations to be held accountable for their crimes. To do anything less would legitimize an institution with prestige it does not deserve. The Obama administration should be sending a message to the world that addressing concerns of ethnic minorities and meeting internationally established human rights conditions is a requirement for receiving U.S. assistance and cooperation. There is no doubt the road ahead for Burma is long and complex, but we must do whatever we can to help ensure the best possible outcome by planning for less than ideal results. I do not believe, however, open-ended military engagement with Burma is the road to success. So on this path of uncertainty, let us learn from past experiences and maintain strategy that has yielded positive results in the pursuit of democracy and freedom for the people of Burma. Let us not forget the victims of the Burmese military repressive actions over the past decades, but rather do whatever we can to ensure reforms continue and build upon the successes already made. I want to thank you uh, for inviting me here this morning to speak with you on this uh, very important matter. Uh, unfortunately, I have two committee hearings, a patents hearing in judiciary and a somewhat easier issue uh, dealing with the current situation in Egypt uh, in foreign <laughs> affairs uh, to deal with. So I have to get back. So I unfortunately won't be able to uh, hear the rest of the uh, speakers. But uh, thank you for your invitation today. Great. Thank Thanks, you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll, uh, we'll turn to panel discussion here in a second. Um, I, re I really do think it's remarkable. He'd, he'd stay on target here and make sure that he, he came as the hearings were arranged in the weeks since we first planned this. So he has two going on right now as we speak. So uh, cloning not being yet, uh, yet um, ethically acceptable to all, let alone um, uh, technologically feasible. He, he, um, he didn't have any other choices, but it was great that he could be here. Um, I'm going to um, turn it over to the panel here in, in just a second. The, um, uh, just one brief comment before we start. Um, I mean, I, I, I've written some things for Heritage, not too um, accepting of the idea of mill-to-mill uh, -mill, uh, relations with Burma at this point in time for a lot of the reasons that uh, Mr. Shabbat laid out. Uh, but, but more broadly, um, my interest has been um, transparency and public accountability for the policy. And I think that 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 interest um, is also reflected on Capitol Hill and, and some of the recent uh, activity there, both in both houses on the National Defense Authorization Bill. There's been action not so much to restrict uh, relations, which already are restricted in, in, uh, in a lot of ways, but to, um, but to impose some sort of accountability, some reporting, some, some idea of exactly what's going on. And I think Mr. Shabbat's uh, um, reference to the hearing he's been trying to organize is a perfect case in point. Um, he, you know, the, the administration has talked about mill-to-mill -mill relations and where it stands in their plans very briefly, I think maybe two sentences in, in Joe Yoon's testimony a while ago and DOD made some testimony. But, you know, if it's, a big, if it's a big deal, if it's important to you, go to Capitol Hill, go to Mr. Shabbat's subcommittee and explain exactly what you're trying to do. You know, I mean, this is a democracy. That's how we come across foreign policy. It's not... It's not uh, it's not fun sometimes, you know, but that's the way we develop it. And I, I hope, um, at the very least, I hope the administration is, is paying attention to that interest and will pay heed to um, the congressman's uh, call to, to explain itself. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our, to our panel. We've got a great, uh, great group of people to explore this issue a little bit further. Uh, John Sifton, who 
who also had some attendance uh, problems today, managed to make it uh, something he, he had to do outside of country, actually um, actually uh, changed, and he was able to be here with us. Uh, he is the uh, Asia, Asia Advocacy Director for Human Rights Watch, uh, where he works on South and Southeast Asia. This is John's second turn at uh, Human Rights Watch. Uh, previously, he was a, a researcher there, and I think I'm sure that the staff there, as does the rest of Washington, appreciates your knowledge of the details and your interest in the details, something that you acquire when you're uh, sort of a line researcher. Uh, I'm then going to turn to uh, Jen Quigley. Jen is Executive Director of the U.S. Campaign for Burma. Um, prior to this, she worked um, for the Women's League of Burma uh, and its member organization. She's been engaged on uh, the issues related to liberty um, and Burma for, for quite a while. I look forward to her remarks. And then I'm going to turn to Keith Luce. Keith, uh, I tried to add it up. I think you spent a total of 24 years on the Hill? 25. 25, OK, 25. <laughs> uh, the last 10 or so, he was um, senior Republican professional staff on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I know you also had a turn in there somewhere in the private sector and some, some business in Indiana. But um, he spent a good deal of his time on Foreign Relations Committee on this issue specifically, and then even more specifically on um, the, the uh, connection with North Korea. Um, in fact, has made several trips uh, to North Korea. I mean, a lot of us can say that about Burma now, but not, still not many of us can say that about North Korea. Um, I can't say it. I got within a foot one time, but that's about as close <laughs> as I could get. So with that, let me turn it over to John. He'll get us started, and then we'll have some time for uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for holding this event. I'm glad I could be here. Um, I'm going to try to be brief, but I, I, want, I thought it would be good to scope out some of the issues that are in play before we get down to the discussion of the political realities. I mean, first, lest there be no misunderstandings about the scale of the issue we're talking about here. Um, at Human Rights Watch, those of us who work on Southeast Asia, the Burmese military is, is up at the top as one of the most abusive militaries in the region. Uh, the abuses we're talking about are not just your run-of-the-mill impunity, you know, mistakes made on the battlefield, uh, some of which rise to the level of criminal culpability. We're talking about a institution which has a decades and decades long record of committing very serious violations of the laws of war and just day-to-day -day very serious human rights abuses outside of armed conflict. Um, and I, that, I just wanted to run through the, you know, what, what we're talking about here. Burma, is, for most of its history since British occupation, has been engaged in armed conflict on many different front lines between the central government and ethnic groups. And that's a situation which um, continues to this day. A lot of those conflicts are in abeyance, you know, with tenuous ceasefires or ceasefire-like agreements. Um, but there are outbreaks of violence. There's skirmishes in Shan State. There was an incident just last week in Kachin State where the military launched a bunch of 60 millimeter rounds onto a uh, area that had civilians in it. There were Kachin uh, rebel forces in that area too that had probably committed abuses by mixing themselves into the civilian population. But the fact remains that you, know, you had something that looked a lot like indiscriminate, uh, indiscriminate force. So there's a lot of serious abuses in the context of the armed conflict. Um, when co conflict is underway, there's incredibly abusive um, methods and means of combat, including shoot on sight uh, and, and uh, indiscriminate or intentional targeting of civilians. But even in the routine sort of civilian life um, of the military, th there are serious abuses. The, the Burmese military, both in conflict and in non-conflict, routinely carries out the use of forced labor, making people carry stuff for them or dig holes for them or do all kinds of things for them, um, uh, including sexual slavery, frankly. I mean, so it's not just about digging holes and carrying, carrying things. Um, economic activities that the Burmese military is involved in, not for military necessity, but just as corruption, essentially, um, also have side issues of human rights abuse, um, as the Burmese military carries out, uh, uses civilian populations to enrich themselves, making them work for them in, in their economic activities, whether it's um, extractives, mines, 
or just, um, I don't know, a, a restaurant or a bar that they set up where they make people work in, uh, or work on. Um, you know, there are rebel abuses as well. There are abuses by ethnic armed forces. They, uh, in, in some contexts, not in scope, but in severity, are, are equal to the Burmese military. Um, this is something to consider when you think about the idea that in peace agreements, some of those forces may be brought within the Burmese, the official Burmese military in the future. Um, there are issues of Leahy vetting that, you know, ought to be aired, given the fact that the written history of Burma is so um, difficult to compile. Um, it's going to be very difficult going forward whether tomorrow or 10 years from now, to properly vet people under the Leahy Law, uh, which prohibits um, assistance and training for people implicated in gross human rights abuses. Uh, you know, on North Korea, the, issue that, the issues that are going to come up um, are not just about uh, weapons issues, but the ties also overlap on human rights abuses. I just wanted to note that when um, in the Human Rights Council in Geneva, earlier this year, the Human Rights Council created a commission of inquiry to look at crimes against humanity in North Korea. A few governments stood up and spoke against that resolution. Um, they weren't members of the council, but they got up and spoke. One of them was the ambassador from Burma, uh, who said that it was better if there was no commission of inquiry, it would be better if they just relied on the universal periodic review of the UN system. Um, so this is the scope, the background. What's politically going on here, though, when, when uh, Representative Chabot talks about the administration wanting all this uh, increased military to military assistance with Burma, why are they just ignoring all these abuses? Do they think it's going to make the abuses go away? What's going on? My best answer to that is there are people in the administration who actually think that military engagement is a means to improving the Burmese military's record. They think that by being closer with the Burmese military, by talking with them, um, the, the ethics and the morality of the U.S. military is going to sort of rub off on the Burmese military. This, this is one argument that they often make. I call it morality by osmosis. Um, another argument is that, you know, we can incentivize it and um, say that, you know, you, you, we'll do a little bit of engagement, but... At the next step, the Burmese military um, won't be given the next step forward, whether it's inviting them to Honolulu for another kind of training or, or whatever, until they meet certain goals. And, and we hear that as well um, when, we, when, when they speak. And on that front, we have a lot of questions at Human Rights Watch and a lot of other human rights groups um, as to why, if that's true, if that's the idea, why doesn't the U.S. administration lay out those benchmarks? and say what ought to be done in order to get the next stage of military assistance. Um, and there's a lot of back and forth on that. The administration says they want to preserve the flexibility to change the benchmarks given you know, differing situations. What if they make improvements on a military front but then lock up some political prisoners? They want to be able to engage the flexibility to which a lot of us say, well, why don't you just tell them the first couple of benchmarks, you know, just the first, one, two, and three, before they get the next step, and you can leave the later benchmarks vague. So this debate goes back and forth. That's one political background that I'd like to, you know, put into play. Another is, uh, Representative Chabot alluded to this, the political diplomatic desire, the need to show Burma as a success story. That's driving a policy in a big way. There, there is a real need to have this come out okay, just for the narrative. Um, and then lastly, and not lastly, penultimately, if that's a word, um, strategic interests. The military rarely says this, the Pentagon rarely says this, but the Pentagon just likes to have closer military engagement with countries, always, when they can. Um, and, they, and even if they say they want to use this as a means to improve the military's record, the fact is they, the Pen there are people in the Pentagon, I shouldn't say the Pentagon monolithically, but there are people in the Pentagon who see military engagement as a strategic good in and of itself. Um, it, it can play a role in soft intelligence gathering, nothing clandestine, just you know, knowing more about another military 
a military's uh, uh, setup is helpful to them strategically. And that's a push factor here for the growth. And then lastly, there's economic issues. Um, there are great economic factors in play that are sometimes too complicated for us to understand, but the bottom line is that there are economic forces which want to uh, move forward in Burma. Some of them are multinational, some of them are American, and military to military engagement doesn't directly sort of make that happen, but there is a certain um, dynamic in which the administration wishes to reward the whole of Burma and military engagement becomes a part of that in order to secure um, greater access to the market. Okay, the, I think, you know, we can go to, I don't know how much time we have, but, um, how much we're, 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 okay. One of the things I think that's worth talking about um, in Q&A and debate and everything are the false narratives that people in the administration and the Pentagon, and even outside um, at other think tanks, have thrown forward because these false narratives are the backbone on which this closer mill-to-mill -mill, uh, discussion is built. Um, one of the false narratives that you hear a lot is that the Burmese military leadership has to be rewarded in what's going on right now since 2011 um, because they'll, be let, they'll feel left out, essentially, if they're not rewarded as they see all the economic and political changes going on all around them. Um, if they don't see themselves getting rewarded or benefiting in some way, politically, economically, it's not clear, they're gonna be spoilers and they're gonna cause problems for the reform process going forward. There's a few ways to rebut this. One is that there's really no empirical evidence for that. It's just a kind of a hypothesis that gets thrown out repeatedly and I, I've never actually seen anybody say, well, I spoke with a general, and he said, if we don't get closer military engagement, we're going to have a coup d'etat. Like, th that never happens. So those statements don't get made. I think it's, there's not even an anecdote, let alone empirical evidence, to support this narrative. Um, it, to me, it's one of those causal arguments that you hear the administrations make, both Republican and Democrat. They just throw out a sort of a causal, if this, then that, and it doesn't, really have any basis in anything that anybody actually knows or heard of. Another one um, is that the military feels threatened by the reform process. This is probably the, one of the more baffling ones because the military is responsible for everything that has happened so far. So why would they be threatened by what they had done? They knew exactly what they were getting into as an institution in allowing this process to go forward. So the idea that they're now sort of threatened, um, it's very difficult to believe. My <coughs> colleague, David Matheson, the senior researcher on Burma, you know, puts it this way. He says, the military is fine. Everything is going fine for them. They've gotten precisely what they had hoped for at this stage in the process. Um, in fact, in some respects, things are going better for them than they expected. They probably thought they were going to have to give up more than they've given up so far in order to get to where they are right now. Uh, if there are economic concerns, if there are members of the Burmese military who feel that they're not getting a cut of the pie economically, that's also a false narrative because everybody knows that when the divestiture of the army, of the military's economic activities takes place, if it ever takes place, um, it will be rife with corruption. I mean, let's be realistic. It will not be a clean process. Even if some of the bids are given openly, there will be massive um, cronyism and, and, and nepotism as the military sheds its economic activities. The economic activities will be put into the hands of military officials who have hung up their epaulets um, or, to their, or to ones who stay behind. It, it will go to their relatives, not all of it, you know, but most of it. So I, I don't think it really makes sense to talk about people feeling threatened, left behind as the reform process goes forward. It's pretty clear that I think anybody who wants to do fine is gonna be able to do fine. 
If they feel politically left behind, well, then again, I, I, I go back to this issue I made at the outset of this section. Why did they launch this process in the first place? They knew exactly what they were getting into, so why would they now be, you know, have, have cold feet? I wanted to take a moment to rebut those because these are very strong narratives, very strong um, canards, chestnuts that get thrown out to, to justify uh, what the administration wants to do, and, and they really need to be discussed. If I haven't done a good job rebutting them, you know, by all means, there may be better articulations. I just wanted to end by saying, this, this is not to say it's not all hopeless. Um, if they go forward, if the administration goes forward with military engagement, um, I think w while they don't want any congressional restrictions, they never want congressional <laughs> restrictions in any country, Indonesia, Cambodia, e Egypt, anywhere. Um, they will not just throw off the, the, the shackles. I mean, they, they will be, they will try to withhold certain things like FMF until certain things are made. Um, and there are attainable goals. They can set benchmarks and say there's not going to be FMF until certain key points are met. And Representative Chabot laid out some of those, um, you know, creating an, an accountability mechanism, an embryonic accountability mechanism. That's attainable. Will it... Will it affect accountability, you know, in the immediate future? Probably not. Uh, but there are a lot of things that, that, that can be done. The record is so bad that there are attainable goals that can be met in the short term. You could stop, the military could stop using forced labor as a widespread issue. It could stop using child soldiers. Uh, not just say they're going to, but actually stop using child soldiers. Um, and they could just stop the, what I call the dumb incidents, the situations where they launch mortar attacks and artillery attacks on civilian targets indiscriminately or intentionally. A lot of those things could you know, be scaled back. Will you get a fully functioning accountability um, mechanism in the Burmese military, rights respecting military? Probably not, but I think Indonesia has shown that even though uh, things can stall out, they, things can get better as well. So these are attainable things that can be happened if the military and the administration acts wisely and says, you need to do this, otherwise you won't get this. And the this and the that are usually the things I've talked about and then things like full IMET, full military training, full FMF, foreign military financing, things like that. Those can be withheld. Last but not least, the administration could use this whole pressure point to get the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights an office in Rangoon. The military and, not the military, excuse me, the government has been blocking the opening of a UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Rangoon uh, for a long time, even though the, the President of Burma made a, a, a promise to President Obama a year ago, almost a year ago, to facilitate the opening of that office. It still hasn't happened. That's an easy pickoff right there. You just say, you're not going to get any more military engagement until that gets sorted out, among other things. So there are attainable goals. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. It was a good uh, rundown of the issues out there. Yeah. Great. Um, so I don't want to reiterate too much the points that Congressman Shabat and, and, um, and John made, but um, maybe highlight some of the other um, pieces that haven't been necessarily touched upon. Uh, and I, I mentioned some of them in my testimony um, last month before the Asia subcommittee. So first is um, understanding some of the motivations or the actions, not the words, behind the government of Burma versus the military. Um, and so I think that there's been so much attention since April 2011 on the what are, are sometimes referred to as like the reformers and the reforms that they've taken. Um, the key thing that we have noticed since that time is that the military cannot be seen as, as part of that group of people who are identified as, you know, reformers. And they're not the ones who've released political prisoners. They're not the ones that have signed ceasefire agreements. They're not the ones that have, you know, brought suit, allowed an election to take place for Suu Kyi became a member of parliament. Um, actually, on the contrary, they have actually done things that have been 
um, counter to the reform process. So, for instance, um, the administration loves to toll out that there are, you know, numerous ceasefire agreements in place now with many of Burma's ethnic minorities. <clears throat> but what doesn't really get into the talking points is how much that the Burmese military has actually violated the terms of the ceasefire agreements. Um, in the case of at least four of the armed um, ethnic groups, two of the Shan groups, as well as the Mon and the Karen, the, the Burmese military has violated the terms of those ceasefire agreements. Um, and it's something that, that has, is covered in, in Burmese media, but it's not necessarily something that makes it into the international um, realm, particularly when our governments, you know, make sure to gloss over the fact that the ceasefires are being ignored, in essence, by the Burmese military. And I bring this up because one of these rationales that we've actually heard, not just from the U.S. government, but from the U.K. or the Australia government, who are also looking to pursue military to military relations, is that the military is part of the reform process, that they allow it to go forward. Um, and one of the key highlights that they say of why the military is part of the reformers group is that they've allowed these ceasefires to take place. And so I just want to dispel that notion that in some way that the Burmese military is allowing the ceasefires um, and honoring those ceasefire agreements. <clears throat> the next thing that I would say, um, we, hear, we hear a lot about um, both why is it that the Burmese government and military have taken the steps that they have or allowed some of these reform steps to go forward? Um, and why is it that the international community, the U.S. or the U.K., I'll show you, are interested in discussions and relationships with the Burmese military? And the biggest one, of course, is, is a balance of power. Um, the Burmese were very much in the orbit of exclusively China and to some extent North Korea. And so the whole idea here, both from the Burmese side as well as from the Western government side is that we need to balance that power. Um, and so therefore there needs to be a level of engagement between our military and their military. Um, but I think what's important to note is we're never going to stop a relationship between, they're never going to say we love you so much and we hate them so much, so we're not gonna have a relationship with China or we're not gonna have a relationship with North Korea. I think it's a bit naive to think that um, a cozying relationship between any of our governments um, and the Burmese government would somehow lead to um, a worsening relationship between the Burmese military and the Chinese or the North Koreans. <clears throat> but so the next thing that um, we at U.S. Campaign for Burma sort of examined was, okay, well, how did we get to where we are um, the successes, the failures of U.S. Burma policy or, or changes that have taken place in Burma, both for the good and for the bad. Um, and and we, we've sort of come away with that the U.S. has overvalued um, the engagement that it has undertaken over the past few years. And they have undervalued um, the role that, that sanctions and conditionality have played in bringing us to where we are today. <laughs> and so... For us, you know, when, we, when our last trip to Burma and, and our sort of our daily correspondence with groups on the ground, they said that the reason why that there have been a release of political prisoners or Aung San Suu Kyi is now in parliament or, you know, any of the things you can point to was because they were tied to the lifting of sanctions. That the Burmese government very, very much valued the uh, removal of sanctions. And it was like, what do they have to do to get the sanctions removed? And that's what they'll do. And it was the U.S. government that lowered the bar about what the conditions were for the removal of sanctions. And so you had a willingness on the part of the Burmese government of they wanted the commercial interests that they would gain from the lifting of sanctions. And it was our side, the US side, that was supposed to say, OK, well, what political gains do, the, do we want from you in order to give you those commercial gains you want from the lifting of, of sanctions? And so I think that at first, you know, there was a bit of success. I think in 2011, we all do look at um, what happened with the release of political prisoners, some, you know, restrictions being lifted for sort of in central Burma, you know, particularly everybody sort of notices when you go to Rangoon now, the, the atmospheric changes that you see um, in the urban centers um, in central Burma. <clears throat> but I think that what most people basically said to us was that without what it is that they need being tied to what it is that we could give leverage, um, that they did not see further reforms moving forward um, at a comfortable pace or at any pace in which there are guarantees for people on the ground inside Burma. <clears throat> and so, you know, for 
for us, the frustration became we were seeing a disparity between what it was people on the ground wanted from U.S. Burma policy and what U.S. Burma policy had become. And so, you know, we looked at, like, well, what are we trying to achieve? And so there's the idea that the U.S. is trying to get Burma to pull away from, from North Korea and, and, to some extent, China, um, and end to violence, you know, bringing about democracy and national reconciliation. Um, but I think the biggest thing for people on the ground in Burma was that that had to be tied to something that was concrete and irreversible, which is constitutional change. Um, and that's not something that you really hear the administration talk about, is there is this disconnect between the lofty goals that we want, democracy and end to violence, national reconciliation, and how it is that we're actually going to be able to help the people in Burma achieve that, right? So we're not going to achieve it, but at the same time, there needs to be a relationship that we have with the people of Burma for how it is that we can strategically move that process forward. And so that's where... For me, we get, we get frustrated because when we talk a lot with people on the ground, um, they don't understand why we have switched to this policy of action for hope, as Congressman Shabat mentioned, as opposed to this notion of having conditions. And that's not to say we're talking about a reimposition of sanctions. It is the idea of using the remaining leverage that the United States has and conditioning that, you know, requiring that there be something demonstrated on the part of the Burmese military or on the part of the Burmese <laughs> government. Um, to then we can advance that. And so, for instance, when we talk to folks about military-to-military -military relations, their biggest thing was, okay, well, the Burmese military needs to demonstrate that they are interested in reform and not to give them something that they want, which is a relationship with the U.S. military, um, for nothing. And that's what we've seen happen so far. And so we um, have heard from... Um, 133 ethnic civil society organizations, I put their letter outside on the table for those who didn't get to see it, in which they laid out what their concerns are about the Burmese military and what they would like the international community to do on their behalf. Because I think one thing that really gets lost in all of this when we sort of talk on a policy level is that it has an actual daily impact on the lives of people on the ground. Um, and so we wanted to sort of interject their voices into this discussion and sort of show, you know, yes, as John mentioned, you have women who are subjected to sexual slavery, forced labor, rampant pandemic land confiscation. You know, I mean, Burma before 2011 already had more than half a million IDPs. And in the past two years, you have an, an additional 250,000 IDPs inside Burma. And so that's not a success story. That's a backsliding. That's a situation getting a whole lot worse for people on the ground. And so when we met with the Department of Defense last, last December, early, early last December, after it was made public that they had allowed Thailand to issue an invitation for some Burmese officers to attend the Cobra Gold military exercises in Thailand, we were very distraught um, about that because not only is this about what they do on the ground, but it is about the fact that they want that prestige, they want that legitimacy. Um, of that type of relationship. And so we said, well, you know, this invitation has been extended. You know, will there be a situation if things get worse on the ground that you will rescind it as a show that you do not accept, you know, the human rights violations they carry out? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. W within days of our meeting, the, Bur the Burmese military for the first time used airstrikes against the Kachin. Um, and we did not rescind the invitation. And they were permitted to go ahead and participate to observe the Cobra Gold exercises. And so it sort of sh shows us that, you know, the administration is taking an approach in which they are, are, you know, in my opinion, rapidly developing this military to military relationship without really taking into consideration the types of consequences that this will have on the gr uh, for people on the ground. <clears throat> um, and it shows us, you know, well, who is it that we're supporting? In Burma, you know, if we have goals of democracy and national reconciliation, um, what are we doing to help those people who would sustain that, right? And so, the Burmese military has not shown that it is interested in the type of reform that we and the people on the ground in Burma need or want, um, and yet we're forging a relationship with them in the hopes that, you know, it's like it. That's just out. It's out there. You know, what is what is the U.S. government's hope? That will come out of this military-to-military -military relationship. They haven't. They haven't. Um, they haven't come out and sort of said what that is. Whereas we see people on the ground saying that this is not going to bring about change for them. It's not going to bring about national reconciliation. It's not going to bring about an end to human rights abuses on the ground, and that's why they've sort of, 
he had this call that we're trying to help them with about saying that we need to have preconditions, you know, and, and hope for, you know, more support from congressional advocates like Congressman Shabbat to sort of put forward this notion that there really does need to be preconditions, that we should not be, you know, guarantee we should not be providing them with legitimacy um, of having this type of relationship, that prestige, um, without there being something tangible benefits that could come for people on the ground in Burma and for furthering our goals of democracy and national reconciliation. <clears throat> and so um, I just want to sort of end on that note um, in sort of saying that that's, you know, the priority in our in our position, you know, backed up by the people on the ground is this, this need to use the maintaining leverage that the United States has, you know, and milita military to military being the, the largest one left in addition to some of the trade benefits um, to ensure that it is echoing the concerns and the voices of, of people that will be impacted um, so that we can make sure that, you know, we actually have um, a a strategy and a process for achieving those goals, as opposed to it just being based on, you know, wishing and hoping that having a relationship will bring some sort of benefit to somebody. Great, thank you. Um, I, I hope we can come back to the um, the issue of uh, balance of power, that narrative, because that's actually a narrative that I think um, I'm particularly susceptible to. And, uh, I, and I question really whether that's going on at all in, in our policy, balancing China's power in Burma and whether we could do that, a lot of other questions that surround that. So hopefully we can come back to that in Q&A. Keith? Walter, thank you uh, for the opportunity to, to be here. And uh, it's great to be with uh, Jen and John, who have uh, committed so much of their lives to promoting freedom and democracy uh, in Burma. I thought that... Uh, Congressman Shabbat was most articulate in his um, survey of the situation uh, within Burma, uh, but in particular, uh, the fact that the ship is adrift uh, with the administration in terms of uh, Burma policy. It increasingly appears that the points, the, the, the benchmarks, the action for action steps in the first, first Obama administration Perhaps this was specific to Secretary Clinton. Perhaps this was a Clinton initiative, which is not being continued um, in the second Obama administration. I would like to commend Derek Mitchell, uh, who is on the ground as our ambassador uh, in Burma, who I think does an outstanding job, especially uh, with the restrictions that, that he's obviously working under. Um, I have some additional perspective this morning on mill-to-mill -mill relations uh, with Burma. And uh, as my uh, uh, co-guests have stated, I, I agree that uh, military relations between the two countries should be contingent upon the establishment and adherence to measurable reform benchmarks, including a wide range of human rights issues and termination of the Burma-North Korea relationship in the military sense. Uh, Jen's reference to the letter uh, signed by the 133 ethnic civil society organizations. Uh, this, this letter and the points deserve a careful review uh, as, as we move ahead. Uh, it's my opinion that progress and reform within Burma are more likely to accelerate with substantive military to military engagement, uh, due in part uh, to the disdain often held toward professionals within Burma's foreign ministry by those uh, who wear the uniforms. Uh, but when I speak of engagement, I'm speaking of confrontation. I'm speaking of sitting down point by point and having discussions and, and covering the entire gamut, as opposed to sitting in Washington, and again, with an ad hoc policy at best, uh, there are questions in Washington in terms of the policy. Well, what if you're sitting in Napida or, or wherever? So, in, in, from my perspective, it's important to have engagement, it's important to confront, to discuss, and uh, I believe that over the long term, communication exclusively between the U.S., others in the international community, and the so-called civilian leadership uh, within Burma, this will have incomplete results. However, uh, prior to proceeding with a long-term plan, uh, Secretary of Defense Hegel needs to be fully informed 
on the full extent of the North Korea-Burma military relationship and the status of Burma's nuclear, biological, chemical, and missile programs, points where the international community has been dismal in expressing interest or concern. The sets of questions to be answered include the following. Number one, going back over the last 13 years, what is the complete list of the multiple military and other projects where North Korean technicians and officials have been present or working inside Burma? Number two, which of the projects or facilities where North Koreans have been or are present have or had a role, directly or indirectly, in the development of Burma's missile and or nuclear programs? Number three, North Korean trading companies which reportedly assisted Syria with the development of its nuclear program have also been working or are working in Burma. What's been their role in the development of Burma's nuclear and missile programs? Point number four. In recent years, North Korean technicians and other workers have entered Burma, often by way of Chinese air flights originating in China. A considerable amount of military equipment and weaponry supplied to Burma by North Korea has entered Burma by way of overland transit through China. To what degree has China's complicity with the major expansion of the North Korea-Burma military relationship been raised with the Chinese, by the US, by the EU, and others in the international community? And if not, why not? Question five, Russia has been transparent in reporting much of its role in the development of Burma's nuclear program. What has been or is China's direct role, officially and unofficially, in the development of these programs? How do North Korean state trading companies, Chinese partners, play a role in assisting Burma nuclear and missile programs? Number six, what is the total list of countries the total list of countries that have knowingly or unknowingly, such as in the shipment of dual-use items, assisted Burma with development of its nuclear and missile programs. Question seven. To what degree has North Korea's ramping up of Burma's military capabilities been raised with North Korea by the United States, the EU, and others in the international community? And if not, why not? On at least three occasions at Senator Luger's request, we raised these issues with the North Koreans. Once uh, they denied uh, working with North Korea in this regard, twice there was no response. These issues need to be raised directly with the North Koreans. Number eight, ranging from SCUDs to submarines to defense radar systems, what is the full inventory of military equipment and weapons provided or planned on being provided by North Korea to Burma. Number nine, while there have been extensive media headlines as to whether North Korean missiles can reach the United States, there has largely been public disregard of North Korea's global network of trading companies and affiliates capable of delivering weapons of mass destruction and or components anywhere in the world. Has the presence of multiple North Korean trading companies within Burma established another beachhead for North Korea's global proliferation capabilities? Does the North Korea WMD highway now link Iran, Syria, Burma, and Pakistan? Number 10, final set of questions and points. Why are Burma's leaders waffling on the encouragement to terminate the military relationship with North Korea. Perhaps they believe that time is on their side, that the international community will swallow concern and questions about the North Korea military connection so as to satisfy the appetite of many in the international community desiring to offset China's business and development influence within Burma. Burma le Burma's leaders know that the United States and the international community, including the United Nations, have failed in deterring North Korea from developing a range of weapons of mass destruction as well as missile capabilities. Burma's hesitance about terminating military relations with North Korea suggests they may have pulled a page from North Korea's manual on how to successfully achieve the same result while disregarding concerns of the international community. 
In conclusion, indeed, considerable reform has, reform has occurred, is occurring within Burma on several fronts. However, it is unlikely, in my opinion, that substantive reform can continue over the long term without directly engaging, without directly confronting Burma's military. But if engagement in this sort is pursued, it must be comprehensive and it must reflect a plan, action for action, incorporating accountability and transparency on the part of the military leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. That was an exceptional series of presentations there. We've got everything out on the table that uh, that we need to talk about pretty much, I think. Um, I wanted to um, ask a question just as you all kind of uh, think through what, what your biggest concerns are. Um, uh, one thing I don't think we touched on that I think would be useful to, to um, you know, explore is the, the reasoning given for a lot of the continuing abuses, whether it's human rights or whether it's the connection with North Korea, is that the civilian government and even the high command of the military doesn't reach the troops in the field, basically, or uh, troops, you know, that are uh, responsible for DDI or something like, you know, the general in charge. Uh, Ten Te was absolved of any, uh, of sort of any knock-on effect to government responsibility. So w what do you make of that, of that, um, of that excuse, really, for, for continuing these uh, abuses or connections with North Korea. John, why don't you start? Um, on human rights issues, I'd say it depends on the human rights abuse. I think when you launch an offensive in Kachin and then the civilian government says, we can't stop it, that's disingenuous. But when units on the ground who have an economic activity ongoing, which has attendant human rights abuses, um, and the central government doesn't even really know about it, and then they find out about it, and they say, well, we'll try to stop it, and they do, but then, there's, but then that, that unit keeps on committing abuses. Then you enter into an area where maybe you have local commanders who, you know, think they can get away with things if nobody's watching. So it depends, it, it, it depends a lot on the human rights abuse. But I think it, either way, it's disingenuous to, to play that card for the Burmese civilian government to sort of play the we're, we don't have the control card. And it's dangerous because it suggests that the issue is one of capacity. If we only had a better military command and control structure and we had better logistics, we wouldn't have so much uh, forced labor. I mean, they played this game with ILO. They said that um, you know, the reason they use forced labor is because they don't have enough trucks or mules or donkeys. So if the ILO gave them more trucks and donkeys, then they wouldn't commit so many human rights abuses. It's a capacity problem, see? So, you know, there's a lot of disingenuous arguments like that. Um, it's, but it's dangerous because it suggests mm -hmm. that, that framework, when in reality, the need is for political will to combat hu rampant human rights abuses. Ultimately, the solution to to all human rights abuses in all countries is institutional solutions. It's not personality driven. You have to create institutions which have mechanisms which hold people accountable when they commit abuses. Uh, but in the short, that, and that's true in all countries. But in the short term, you do need personalities at the top who are driving down the policy that you have to stop doing these bad things. So I think, yeah, I think it's disingenuous. Mm -hmm. sure. I think there's two points to be made here. One is, um, when, when is it policy? Um, what human rights abuses that are carried out are carried out as a result of policy. And then two, the other is looking at the issue of um, command structure. And so I think on the first one, you know, it is definitely, I agree with John, disingenuous to say that the government is somehow not in control because the government has made no efforts to change the self-sufficiency policies, the way in which the, the army um, is funded, what activities they have control over, particularly in the economic realm. Um, and if and anybody in government had actually decided to put forward, even in words only, the notion that there needs to be these types of policy changes and how the military carries out activities, then maybe potentially you could say that the government, you know, doesn't have control and the military does. And so I think that there is definitely um, the connection between the government and the human rights abuses through their, you know, at, at best, the lack of empathy for changing, you know, or trying to address military policy that, um, 
furthers the human rights abuses that take place. <clears throat> I think the second one, I think the thing that people actually are more more focused on is is the power structure, right? So the president of Burma at three separate times issued ceasefires. You know, one was a nationwide ceasefire and two were Kachin specific. Um, all three were ignored. And so the big question becomes, well, since he doesn't technically have the legal authority by through the constitution to tell the commander in chief, and then the commander in chief would then have to follow that command. Um, it, it, the question becomes, well, did, did they insane do that just for the, you know, international community to keep, keep the, ref, you know, keep the money and the flowing and the sanctions to continue to be lifted? Um, and he didn't really care about there actually being implementation of nationwide ceasefires or was this that he did want that and the commander in chief says, well, you know, I'm not, I don't have to listen to you and, and I actually don't want to pursue that policy. Um, you know, and through numerous conversations, nobody understands the relationship truly between Thane Sane and Commander Min Online. And so I think that it's, it's not something we'll be able to sort of say how much of this is there a deep connection or um, a deep disconnect um, between the, you know, former military heads of government versus the military heads of government inside Burma. Um, but I would say, you know, like I said, but it's disingenuous to think that, you know, considering that they continue the policies um, and the impunity um, for human rights abuses that the military commits shows that there isn't really an interest um, in their part. Nothing to add. Okay. Uh, questions? Wow, there were a lot of questions. Anyway, so right here. Um, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank uh, you. My name is Steve Hirsch, a journalist who periodically covers Burma. Uh, excellent presentation. I, um, uh, one of the speakers, I think it was John Sifton, uh, suggested that that uh, uh, that the uh, that, that one reason to to continue uh, to to institute mill mill cooperation is to um, uh, 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 is in connection with lowering sanctions. Uh, with, with Burma, I just want to raise that uh, last year, Bertel Lindner, uh, in an article, uh, in three articles, uh, 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 claimed to have a military document uh, uh, which set out actually a plan on the part of the Burmese military, uh, the Burmese, yeah, the Burmese military, to sort of fake reforms in, 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 um, in hopes of getting the Americans to uh, lift sanctions. Uh, I'm wondering if if you or any of the other panelists have thoughts on that. The other thing is, I feel I have to ask this question in the current political environment. This this has been portrayed as the Obama administration plan, and I note that you have nobody from the administration um, on the panel. Uh, Burma policy, at least for the last 10 years, has sort of been consensus among Republicans and Democrats. Uh, is this truly, as this panel sort of is portraying this, is this an Obama administration God alone policy, or is this, uh, or is this a policy which which has support from Democrats and Republicans outside the administration? Thanks. Can I just take the last part of that since um, my responsibility to organize the program and that sort of thing? Um, <laughs> it wasn't an accusation. No, no, I know, I know. Um, uh, first of all, I, I did not ask someone from the administration to to. Um, to attend, I mean, I, I wish I could say that I invited them and they declined, but maybe I, I anticipated a decline, so I didn't invite them. But, um, but, but no, I think you're, I think you're right that it is an Obama administration initiated policy. Uh, I think there's no question about that. I mean, they own the policy, but they have been careful to bring along the big stakeholders in Burma policy on the Hill. Uh, and have negotiated and, and sort of um, consulted very closely with McCain and Feinstein and McConnell and, and all of those. That's why it's, and I pointed out earlier, it's interesting that in the wake of that, there have been some other members that have stepped in to feel, fill the gap, like Trent Franks and Congressman Shabbat and a few others who have taken an interest whose names yet are not as associated with the issue as McCain and McConnell. But um, there is still a, 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 a and unease in, in certain circles in Congress with the way the policy uh, is developing because it is largely bipartisan. You mean overall, just not no, no. Um, unease with the... Uh, well, no, I would say, well, a little of both, but, but more so on the mill mill. I mean, I, the, the circle of 
consensus on the on the general policy, I'd say, is much broader. But on the mill mill, it's is where things have, where they've really gotten attention, which to me underscores the maybe a a tactical error on the administration's part. I mean, they, they've been running the po they've been running the table on Burma, Burma policy for the last two years. Um, everything's going in your direction. Why would you even provoke this and, and get people that otherwise wouldn't wouldn't be causing you a problem uh, by stretching it into mill mill relations? Um, but but at any rate, let, let me let the others address the other points you make. Please, why don't you um, start? On on the political front, I mean, really quick, it definitely is a bipartisan goal. I mean, a lot of things wouldn't have happened if Senator McConnell in particular hadn't agreed. So I don't think you could really hang any of this around the Obama administration solely. Um, but with that said, there's a growing um, number of questions coming from both sides of the aisle about the mil military to military. And I think the fir we should be very explicit about where this is going to come to a head. If the Obama administration doesn't change its policy, then a policy will be imposed upon them by law. And it will come in the form of an appropriations bill or the defense appropriations bill, which is a kind of an uncharted territory. If there is no appropriations bill, then it will come perhaps as a rider, a so-called anomaly to the continuing resolution, maybe, if we can lift that. And if it, do if it doesn't happen as a law, then it's going to have to happen as congressional pressure on the administration through hearings and letters and all that stuff. But one way or another, you know, if, if, if the administration doesn't change its policy, I think there are more and more people in Congress who are going to be asking hard questions in the Appropriations B Committee and in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. You asked about the... Um, Bertles. Military what? plan. No, but after that, the mil uh, <coughs> Your second question was... Yeah, my second question was not the, the politics. My first question was... You answered the second question. Either you or yeah. Jennifer had raised the issue of, of, of a trade-off between reform yeah. and cooperation, and I pointed out that Brother Whitner had written, yeah. uh, cited this, this yeah. military document last year. No, I mean, I think it's natural for all regimes to do, like, the very least that they can get away with. And one of the arguments uh, we at Human Rights Watch have been making throughout this whole process, not just with military to military, but with the sanctions lifting, and I think Jen's been making this argument too, is it's not only a waste, it's not, it's not only like watching somebody burn a stack of 100 bills to, to see them mm -hmm. give away uh, leverage. It's also damaging because it sends the message to the regime that they can reform or not and still get the rewards. Mm -hmm. And that is an immediate incentive for them not to reform. It actually... It's not just as a waste, it actually is counterproductive. It suggests to them in clear terms that a preschooler could understand you don't need to reform. Yeah, I went over this actually in, in, in detail in my testimony in September. Like I did, you know, because one of the things that we've noticed is people don't pay attention to the timeline of when events have taken place and what when different reforms have taken place and when different sanctions have been lifted. And you can clearly see that you had, you know, like if you talk about significant reforms taking place before sanctions are lifted and after sanctions are lifted, a, a, a real drop off in reforms that have um, taken place. And so, you know, Bertel always has excellent intel, intel. And so it's just like, you know, I completely agree with him. And the events, when you look at a timeline, completely correspond with what it was that he was saying. Uh, Keith, you were on the Hill when all of this started, right? I mean, the reform effort, the approaches to... Uh, foreign relations committee by the administration, all those discussions. How, how do you see the dynamic on the Hill on the issue? Actually, uh, Walter, since I've not been on the Hill for a while, uh, when? since uh, earlier this year. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, right. But you were there when, when the new Burma policy started a couple, two or two, three years ago. Well, two to three years ago, the uh, uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, those around her were quite active in reaching out to the Hill early on mm -hmm. and uh, discussing not only what they hoped to do, but they requested input from members, staff, Democrat and Republican. They were very mm -hmm. active. Yeah, I think there's, um, I, I think there's been a certain amount of disdain on the part of the administration for that next tier of congressional interest. So they talked to McConnell, they talked to McCain, they talked to Feinstein, and when the 
the lesser known figures like Trent Franks expresses an interest, you know, they, they have no time for it. I, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's basically true. I think they also got tired of it because it, it's been, now they have an ambassador there and it, two years ago, I think that there was a sense that everything was sort of being run out of Washington, but now it's very much being run out of the embassy in Rangoon and briefing congressional members, let, let alone staffers, is becoming more rare. Um, I, I, should, I should note that although there's not a lot of hearings, they do come up to talk to the staff quite routinely. And although they're not here today, I, I've had their side of the story many times. And I can tell you what they say is very reassuring. They say, we don't want to move quickly. We want to move very slowly. We're, going, we're not going to do anything big anytime soon. There's not going to be any FMF or military financing. There's not going to be any full IMET right now. We just want to talk with them. We want to confront them and t talk about what we want to see from them. And as things move forward, then we'll begin to uh, reassess, and perhaps there'll be some IMET programs, small. It'll be very, you, know, you won't be worried. In other words, they're trying to reassure you. And it is reassuring for a moment. And then you turn around and you open up the newspaper and you read that in Brunei at the ASEAN US summit, military, the military component before the full summit began. Secretary Hagel has invited the, the defense minister to Honolulu. And you say, well, well, you're moving too fast. I thought you said you were going to move very cautiously. And now you've given away another mm -hmm. chip, just like that. Uh, Jen, Jen, did you disagree with my uh, take there? I was just trying to read your your body language. There. Oh, sorry. Um, no, they didn't. They didn't consult Feinstein. So mm -hmm. I yeah. just mm -hmm. I wanted to add actually that I'd heard. Um, you know, so what Keith said. You know, we we work a lot with the, the Hill, and um, they did. You know, Senator, uh, Secretary Clinton. <laughs> I always forget. You know, all the senators become secretaries now. Um, you know, she did go up to the Hill, but that was back in two thousand nine when they were. Um, you know, first rethinking what they, what they called, you know, principled engagement um, and adding that to sort of like their bag of tools. Um, but then the policy really dramatically changed in 2011, um, and that's where you didn't see as much Hill visits. And, and it really sort of became exclusively visiting McConnell and McCain, um, nothing on the House side um, whatsoever, um, and not even with, you know, Feinstein. And, and there was some anger in that, that all of a sudden it was like, well, we just need sort of like the other party um, to sort of sign off on what we're doing and, and didn't even try and consult with its own party. And I know that that upset many members of the Democratic Party who had been longstanding um, advocates for Burma um, to, not, to no longer be consulted by the administration. So I would say that, you know, echoing their points, that it, it, it is an Obama policy in which they are trying to do as little consultation as they possibly can get away with. I'm glad you, you clarified that. Uh, other questions? Thank you. Um, Lynn Quark, Harvard Kennedy School. Um, Jennifer, you mentioned earlier that um, the people on the ground want things to be tied to something, con want changes to be tied to something concrete and irreversible. And for that, you um, mentioned constitutional change. Who are the people that you're referring to? Are these the Burman majority? Are these the ethnic armed groups? Are they the opposition parties? And what constitutional change um, are you referring to? Are you talking about um, decreased military representation in parliament? Are you talking about the constitutional amendment to, to allow Aung San Suu Kyi to run for president, um, to, to assume a president, uh, to become president? And um, the th or, or are you referring to um, a greater degree of federalism in Myanmar to be incorporated into the constitution? So um, we normally um, consult with um, civil society, that being ethnic minority civil society as well as Burman civil society. Um, the same with the ethnic armed groups as well as um, political parties, be Burman majority political parties or um, ethnic political parties. Now, what there is sort of, I would say, more universal agreement on is, is the need for constitutional change. What there is disagreement on is whether that is throw out the 2008 constitution and have a new constitution. Um, and so we, we haven't taken, say, the position of should there be only amendments to the 2008 or should there be a new constitution because there isn't consensus 
on what should what should take place. But there is consensus on the idea that the current the way that the the current state of the 2008 Constitution will not bring about a federalism. It will not bring about national reconciliation. Um, and, it, and this really goes much, you know, to, to 98% of the people in Burma, it all goes much beyond just the Suu Kyi clause, as it's referred to. This really has to do with um, civilian control of the military. It has to do with um, protections um, and rights for minorities. Um, you know, independence of the judiciary. Um, you know, the control over the military's budget, you know. And so it's like this goes much, you know, a decentralization. So, of course, um, the, the, the term that most people use is federalism, but it's the whole idea of that decentralization of power. Um, and that's sort of something that you can sort of see across the board um, is what people are calling for. It's one of the sort of the unifying factors um, amongst um, ethnic groups, whether they be majority or minority, is the need for constitutional change. Um, and Dan Sullivan with uh, United to End Genocide. Um, so, you know, what our organization looks for especially is threats of genocide or mass atrocities happening. And um, what we've said is we've seen in, in Burma the building blocks of, of genocide. Um, and that's through the, the anti-Muslim violence, the uh, propaganda that's going around. So I just wanted to ask about the, the military's role in that, seeing reports or evidence of at the very least, um, the military standing by while these abuses are, are happening, um, and then also reports that maybe even you know direct complicity. There may be some disagreements about this among various people, but um, I want to distinguish between the issues of the police. The, I want to first of all distinguish between abuses that take place in Arakan and anti-Muslim violence throughout the rest of the country because um, that, that's one thing right off the bat that I, I want to draw a distinction between. The distinction is this. Police forces in Arakan, where the violence against Rohingya was predominant in 2000, in the last year, 18 months, um, those forces were complicit, cannot be trusted to keep security. Uh, and in a situation like that in Arakan, it's quite possible that the only forces that can be counted on to stop abuses are, in fact, the Burmese military, to be brought in from other provinces to Arakan to keep security. And although nobody hates the Tatmadaw more than Human Rights Watch, well, perhaps you, <laughs> um, the, uh, the fact is they may be the last and only hope in a in a full outbreak of violence. They did play a role in stopping some of the worst kinetic violence um, that took place over the last 18 months at certain times. But in the rest of the country, uh, this, is primarily a this is primarily a police issue, and the, there is complicity of the police standing around. But Human Rights Watch does not feel as though the military could play a productive role in keeping security in the rest of Burma outside of Arakan. We think it would probably be a bad idea for the military to begin getting involved in that. The, the pressure instead needs to be put upon the relevant authorities who control the police to ensure that the police take action. Well, first of all, don't take part in violence against Muslims, but secondly, that they take action to stop communal violence against Muslims. There's an, but the, here's the problem. The lead on policing, training, and all that is, is, is the EU. It's not the US. The US is not going to take the lead on the policing. Um, so it's not going to be a leverage point for, for the US so much. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty much all I can say about that. I think there are a lot of hard questions that could be asked on the bigger political level, though, where you say this issue of anti-Muslim violence, violence against the Rohingya, is a holdup on the entire relationship. And if we don't see improvement on that, you're not going to see improvement on the military engagement. It's not holding the military accountable for it and saying they have to be part of the solution, but it's linking the two issues on a political level and a di on a diplomatic level. Oh, can, wait, can I? Yeah, sorry. Um, I have a bit to add to that. Um, so, you know, we don't, we don't do on-the-ground research and documentation like Human Rights Watch does to say 
you know, genocide or, or not. But we, I mean, we agree with them about eth the ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity, and it's been well documented, not just by Human Rights Watch, by, but some others as well. Um, but the thing that we actually sort of disagree on is the role of the Burmese military. Um, we, what we've seen very troubling from the very start of that violence in Arakan State in June of 2012 was the idea that more security forces, more boots on the ground is what is going to prevent violence. Um, and I think that there that is an incredibly dangerous road to go down for two reasons. One, that's exactly the road the military wants you to go down, is the idea that there needs to be a stronger security presence everywhere in the country. Um, because we saw this other this spread of anti mine violence in other parts, and the whole idea was well, more security forces, more than the, to justify the role, the outstretched role of the Burmese military in the country. And so we are really anti anything that suggests that. Well, you know, since there, since it would be Burmese military forces who are not Rakhine ethnic from other parts of Burma. Well, I mean, they did they committed atrocities elsewhere. So why, you know, so it's like some sort of notion that. They're just not as bad. It's like choosing, you know, and this is a really bad metaphor, but between the emperor and Darth Vader, it's like <laughs> I'm really not interested in choosing that these are my only choices, you know. Um, and the issue, though, I feel like a lot of people are focusing on this idea of security sector reform and not a lot on accountability and justice sector reform. Um, I think you're going to see violence continue and get worse and spread if you don't have anybody being anybody of authority, right? So we're seeing, you know, Muslims arrested disproportionately to Buddhists, and then you'll see some Buddhists arrested. But I don't think that, you know, there's there's really no accountability mechanisms for any police forces, security forces, government officials on, on local, state, or union level who are held accountable for the violence. And so I feel like, you know, yeah, things are going to get worse, and you do see that because there is no international attention. Even the international attention is on security sector reform, and it's not on accountability and justice mechanisms. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just picking up on this discussion about the role of the Burmese military, I'm wondering, are there certain types of military engagement that, um, you know, don't fall within that reward framework? And I'm thinking specifically of disaster relief, um, you know, because, you know, like the, you know, cyclones are becoming a regular occurrence in the Bay of Bengal, and we saw with Cyclone Nargis that the U.S. military, or at least the Navy, you know, wasn't able to uh, deliver relief by sea. And I wonder if, you know, maybe um, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief engagement, would that be actually, you know, a, a, you know, getting to this issue about the role of the military, would that be actually, a, you know, a, um, a, an aspect of engagement mm -hmm. that is worth pursuing, um, you know, in the meantime, because, you know, uh, I think John alluded to institution building. You know, this is, takes a very lengthy time. Um, it's a lengthy process. So just, um, I'm actually really glad you brought this up because we're actually against that notion because it gives the military a justification to be in places that people inside Burma don't want them to be. Um, so the idea of the military having a role in which they can justify being in Karen villages or in, or in um, Rohingya villages where... We they those local people don't want them there and like for instance, for those of you that follow Burma pretty closely, there was um, a cyclone that was coming at Arakan State and you had Rohingya who were displaced and they were on the beaches and so the military was like well we have to get you off and they were just like they weren't going to go anywhere with a Burmese soldier it just was not going to happen and they actually you know it was like a very tense few days in which you know local NGOs that those people trusted they had to like tell the Burmese military, you need to step back, you need to not even be anywhere where people can see you. The only way we're going to get these people off these beaches is if we convince them to remove themselves from these beaches um, because they wanted to relocate them to a military base. And so the people were just like, I'm not, that's just not going to happen. And so the idea of these people that they, you know, fear above all else, um, having an outsized role in that is just something that's really antithetical to what people on the ground really want from them. I, we're also against military engagement on the disaster release front um, for the same reasons, but also because, uh, well, well, I should amend it by saying if you're going to support disaster relief, then support civilian disaster relief uh, uh, institutions in Burma. You can do that. It can be done. We can do that in the Foreign Office Bill. But there's another reason, which is that the... U.S. military is always looking for innocuous IMET programs. M maritime security is one of their favorites. 
you know, we can't work with the Sri Lankan military because they're complicit, there's the Sri Lankan army because, you know, their leaders were complicit in massive crimes in the end of the war against the Tamil Tigers. So we'll work with the Navy. We can't work with the Philippines army because they have this terrible record of impunity and extrajudicial execution. So we'll work with the Navy instead. So it's Navy, 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 maritime security, it's Cambodians, Cambodia's uh, RCAF as well, the Royal Cambodian Armed Forces. So they're always looking for innocuous things to do as, a, as an end run around this. Instead of all that, I agree with Keith. Engage if you want to, but be confrontational. You can send folks there and say, this is what's wrong with your military. Here's how we think you can fix it. If you don't fix these problems, the only further engagement we're going to have is more of this, me yelling at you. Well, not yelling, but you know, confronting you. And so that's probably most constructive. It's not exactly capacity building. It's more like um, an adversarial relationship which has a productive outcome. Yeah, right down in this middle there, at the bottom, the blue shirt. Women, women. Oh, yeah. Here. Um, my question is, uh, uh, my name is uh, Win Min uh, from uh, Bahu Development Institute. My question is, uh, is there any like position um, privately or uh, publicly by the NLD and our Sensuji on the military to military relationships and, um, yeah, for the Myanmar Army, Pama Army? Because she appears that she was uh, trying to have the UK military uh, help uh, the Burmese military because she visited Sandhurst yeah. uh, last week and um, the defense minister was saying they are trying to deal with the Burmese military to like teach like principle of democracy and uh, okay. yeah, civilian control over the military things like that and I, I, I heard that uh, there is going to be a uh, training by the UK military officials yes. inside the country, training like 30 Myanmar Burmese military officers. And I also uh, heard that there was a US former general uh, who went to talk to the Burmese military uh, to train, uh, to send some of them to part of the ASEAN, I mean trainees in Honolulu. Yeah. But the Burmese military side, you know, um, said uh, they may send only two because their English is not good. But uh, other ASEAN countries have sent like 30 military officers. So what I'm thinking, what I'm saying is that is there like any, well, on some influence is so much you know, influential on the states, you know, our policy in the past. And I think it is still the same today. So that's my question, thanks. Sure, so, no, and it's a good question. Um, <coughs> Suu Kyi, so the NLD doesn't necessarily have a position, but Suu Kyi has spoken about military to military relations, and she has said she is in favor of human rights training, um, training on international human rights law, international humanitarian law for the Burmese, for the Burmese army. But she has asked that that be um, tied to pushing for um, constitutional change. Now, she has not said that the constitutional change needs to be a precondition, but she is sort of asking for there to be this sort of exchange, like, you know, have our militaries train them on, on human rights law, um, and at the same time, we're saying, okay, well, the tit for tat that we're looking for is for you to, to green light and agree to constitutional change, and that seems to be the, the tie that she is making. Um, with with re regards specifically to the British, though, right, so for instance, she greenlit um, the idea of what we call DILS here, the Defense Institute for Legal Studies. They did a they did a trip to Burma and they met with her and they met some other civil society and, and the Burmese military. And so that's something that she is in support of. Um, but the British, you know, they, they are pursuing, I guess, a bit more than us. Um, they've denied a freedom of information request on the trainings from our partner, Burma Campaign UK, which wanted to understand truly what this human rights training that the, you know, actually what this training would be between the Burmese uh, military and and the British military because the official um, language of the courses that they're supposed to take are an art of war, um, which would go beyond the scope of just human rights training. And so there is a lot of contention right now that just like, you know, um, the British, like the U.S. walks, you know, talks a good talk, but then in the end they, they turn around and do something different. There is concern that right now that the British are doing the exact same thing, <coughs> saying that they're just going to do human rights training, but in actuality they've gone a step beyond that with the program and courses that they're offering um, to the Burmese military. 
I can tell that the U.S. wants to go beyond Dills because the language that ultimately ended up in the Senate committee, Appropriations Committee markup of the Foreign Ops Bill um, contains an allowance for not just EIMET, which would allow DILs, but also this disaster relief type of training. They definitely want to do more and would do more if they could. Um, the Australians should be brought in the mix. Their defense attache is going to try to create more engagement between the Australian military and the um, Burmese military. I should say in this context that the Pentagon also plays a role in coordinating with other militaries. And one of the suggestions we have for them is that they speak often with the British and Australians and coordinate all this so that you know one military isn't doing something that the other isn't. On the constitutional level, I just wanted to add one quick thing. The, um, it's not just the Aung San Suu Kyi clause. Obviously, the, the reform that is necessary, whether it's scrapping and creating a new one or fixing the Constitution, the reform is broad, and it will be linked to ultimate military engagement by the U.S. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the U.S. Congress is going to lay out some red lines that can't be crossed. Maybe it'll be foreign military financing that can't be crossed unless that Constitution is amended to remove the restrictions on civilian governance. I mean, that basically give the National Security and Defense Council authority to dismiss the parliament, appoint a commander-in-chief, uh, all the sort of vetoes that the, that the military has over civilian governance had to be removed from the Constitution. Otherwise, I don't think Congress is going to allow full military financing. That's not, you know, this year, but 2015 probably. I think that's the red line that's going to be drawn. Hopefully it's more than just FMF, because it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. not a whole lot of uh, leverage when you can buy things from a lot of other places. Um, I think we have to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for the presentations. It's been a great uh, conversation. I think we've gotten to a lot of what we wanted to cover today. Thank you very much. Thank you.